It's a blessing to have each of you here. Special welcome to the visitors this morning. I was sitting here like an old man thinking about what I forgot. We, uh, we didn't tell you or we didn't plan to tell you from the minister's room out here, but we are planning to have or start an instruction class for baptismal. And uh, um, help me out. Cheyenne, at this point, is planning to be in that class. And in a couple weeks, we'd like to start that, but we're going to leave a little bit of space there if there's someone else that wants to join. So be praying about that. And, uh, I just want to tell you that we're always open to start anytime. So if there's someone here that wants to do that, let us know. <clears throat> I don't know how you prepare yourself for, or maybe you don't prepare yourself, or maybe you do kind of like I've done for a lot of my life. We come up to these, these holidays, what we call holidays, these major pivot points in our Christian uh, faith, uh, Easter, Christmas, there might be more, but those two come to mind. And this year I decided that I'm going to try to, a month in advance, I'm going to try to prepare myself for beyond just the day of Easter, but for the Easter season. And I like to think about the Christmas season beyond just one day. If it's just one day, then it doesn't last very long. And I this seems elementary, but it, it's been a blessing to me, and it's been kind of a time of, of reflection about my connection with God. And so for the month of March, I've, I've decided to focus on what is the most popular verse in the Bible? You all know it, I'm sure. John 3.16. So I decided to focus on John 3.16, and so this morning, I, I don't know what else to title this message other than just John 3.16. I, I have been pondering, I've been thinking about this verse, and, and I've been trying to think about my personal connection with God and what this verse, why is this the most popular verse in the Bible? Well, it's, someone said the, it's the Bible in a nutshell. And it's, it's, it has so much meat to it. Now, I would like to, I, I don't know how to do this because I don't like to read a whole passage and then pick one verse out, but it seems like there's, there's a good bit of context around the verse. And I, I didn't plan on saying this, but one of my, uh, something that I came, I know this, someone would say this is so last year, everyone knows this, this is not a big deal, but I came across, or I, happened upon the story about Tim Tebow, and I'm sure that probably everyone knows this, but it made an impression on me, and it, it reminded me that God has his way of using whatever means he wants to, to enlighten people and, and um, get his message out. Tim Tebow was a, a, a college, I think first a college football player. I'm not into football. I'm not against football. I'm just saying I'm not, this is not about football, but um, he, as a baby, the doctors encouraged his mom to abort him. And because of her Christian faith, she said, no, I'm not going to do that. And there's a, a whole other story. You, you probably will go Google that, whatever, but do it. And so this is not to endorse college or, or professional football, but what he, his life then he felt like he had a mission, and so when he was in college, he, you know how they always, I don't know why they paint that black stripe under their eye, but someone maybe can tell me later on, but they do. He put a scripture reference right there, and so I don't know which game it was, but they played a game, and it said 316 right there, somewhere on his face. And in that game, I guess there were 94 million Google hits on John 3.16. And I'm not saying this because that means that there were 94 million or 93 million or however many million that all, all of a sudden became converted. I'm only saying that just a little step 
in, in us going forward for the kingdom can make a huge impact. And a number of years later, I don't, I don't follow the stats. It's just a story to me that, that impressed me. A number of years later, he played another game, and I think this was maybe on professional level, uh, whatever they call that, NFL. And all his, it was exactly, I think it was exactly three, three years later, somehow everything lined up to his stats were 316. 316. And again, I think there were something like 90 million hits on John 316. And he just broke down and cried and he said, whatever you think you're doing, whatever we think we're doing, if you have just a little bit of faith and you're willing to share that, God can use that in such marvelous ways that it's totally not about football or what I can do. And so remember that whether you're a carpenter, a housewife, wherever you're at in life, if you have a little bit of faith and you're willing to share that little bit of faith, it can, God can just multiply that to no end beyond what we can ever think or imagine. Okay, that was bunny trail. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you stand, and I, I, like I said, I don't like to read a long passage. We all know John 3 We've all grown up in church. We know that John 3 is the passage that talks about being born again, born of the Spirit. But let's read it. Stand with me as we read that. I'm going to read 20 verses, so it's going to take a little bit of time here. The story of Nicodemus, maybe I'll start verse 3. He was a Pharisee. He came by night to Jesus, and he said he had questions for him. And, and he understood that Jesus, the message of Jesus was different than what they were preaching or teaching, and he had some questions, and so I'll just break in verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And maybe I'll pause here just briefly. You know, I've heard this preached on many times growing up and, and in church, and people talked about him being ashamed of, of connecting with Jesus, but I am glad that if he was ashamed of it, if he came at night, still he came. And because of his coming to Jesus, we have this passage. And he asked questions that maybe I would have or someone else would have asked, and there are the answers. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. Goeth so is every one that is born of the Spirit." Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive our, not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now let's all say verse 16 together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Blessed promise. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You may be seated. 
I just kind of went with the red, red letter there where Jesus was speaking. So I, I think there's a lot of context around what I'm focusing on in, in verse 16. And I, I don't know how, to, how to, to get this together in 10 or 15 minutes. It is so elementary that sometimes we forget to even preach about it. We forget to talk about the fact that you must be born again. There is, if we're not saved, we're not going to heaven. And it, there's so much that has been said about this that, that I, I find myself short in knowing where to jump in and, and where, where to, uh, to let go this morning. But just, just briefly here... Uh, the, the new birth, the salvation experience, sometimes it feel, it is felt to me that uh, it is so mystical that we put a lot of time into explaining something that we're not quite sure how to explain. We're not quite sure how to, to tell someone how they're supposed to become born again or what it looks like or it, it uh, tends to become a little hazy. And I hope I'm not... I hope I'm not muddying the water by what I'm saying. It has been good for me just to ponder on this and to think seriously about my relationship with God. How does that look? And as you think of, of many that have gone on before, when you cut down to where it's my turn to stand in front of God, then all the excuses I can think of to not serve him, to do whatever, really just fade, and all of a sudden it becomes very serious that, that I have a relationship with him. And that is, is something that I've said. I try to say it to every bus group I speak to. The most important thing about whatever you say about your faith or your religion or, is that you have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I say that, I mean you pray every day, you read your Bible every day, you, you have a relationship. You talk to God. Now, some observations. I, I think that sometimes these, we like straight lines, and I'm no different. I, I like when someone can just say, well, it's this way. You know, this is what I did. This is how I had an experience. I had a, a time when I felt like I became born again. I, I just, but have I sinned since then? Yes. I've had failure in my life. I have had to say I'm sorry to people. I've had to confess my sin in the church. I've had to uh, confess my sin to God. I have had failure. And so sometimes I, I think we, we get to this place where we like straight lines and we say, well, we had this experience and now we've, we failed. What happened? I know this is kind of a off the beaten path, hilarious something, but we like to say, okay, so you do this, so you're in the kingdom, you did that, so you're not, now you, and so sometimes, this is, I don't know why this even entered my head, but in, in some strange way, it kind of felt like, in a completely different context, it felt like Jeff Foxworthy was saying, so you might be a redneck if you, and then you fill in the blanks. It's funny, yeah. But it's not that straight. It's not, we are all on a path. And all of us are, God is in the process of saving us. And I hate it. I shouldn't say I hate it. I wonder what God thinks. Put it that way. If we say, oh, you, you, you're, you're okay. You, you don't have it, but I have it. You've not. And I, I think we need to be very, very, very careful that we don't shut up the kingdom of God. And I want to talk about that a little bit more as we go along. Now we know that by their fruits you shall know them. That's scripture. We've been taught that well. And, and so if there's something that is outside of the spirit of God as it, as it uh, is laid out in the Bible, we can kind of discern and we should and we should be thinking about that. However, we are not. We, I am not in place to judge anyone. I am only there to encourage people and to point out I am not there. Again, straight lines. You know, it really burdens me when we've, we kind of have this mindset that 
So, some people just, the kingdom just doesn't seem open to them in our heads. Well, they didn't come from the right background. They didn't go to the right place. They didn't, and so they get questioned extra hard until finally it almost seems like we are kind of shutting off the kingdom to a certain segment because they have a rough background. And I'm saying this because of a conversation that I had with a, an individual that was adopted in a conservative Mennonite church. And this individual said, openly was questioned and, and told, well, you know what? We just know what happens with those that are adopted. And she said, I know, I know. But she's chosen to stick with the church and to be faithful. But it grieved me to no end. And it, this is not something that happened in our circle, but in conservative Mennonite circles. Those things should never be, never. Do we know? Yes, we know. We know there's struggle when there's a rough background, but that should not be ever said of Christian people. Never. That really grieved me. Let me just tell you, God has no grandchildren, and we've all heard that from this pulpit. God has no grandchildren. None of us has a straight line to God because of our parents or what our parents did. Now, that might have helped us, and I am thrilled if we have a proper background in a church setting. That's what we strive for. But God has no grandchildren. That, we cannot ride on the shirt tails of those that were before us. We cannot, we cannot expect to get to heaven because my dad was a preacher or a missionary or a devout Christian. It is, in, it is on our shoulders to make that decision to, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. A.W. Tozer said this. I just found this this morning. This is something I saved, and I may have said it here, but... I'll quote him, we may as well face the hard truth that men do not become Christian by associating with Christian or church people, nor by religious contact, nor by religious education. They become Christians only by an invasion of their nature by the Spirit of God in the new birth. A.W. Tozer said that. And I believe that's true. And it's hard to absorb that, especially if you're a church-going individual that comes from the right stock. It is, it is wonderful, but it's not the answer. It certainly is not. It's going to take more than that. It is, we, none of us is a textbook case. Now, if I'm not careful, I'm going to spend so much time on the first part of this, this passage that I won't even get to John 3.16. I know that we like, and I'm, I'm just going to warn again, we like these straight lines of once and done. I had an experience back there. I certainly did. And I don't regret that I did. I remember well how that just kind of washed over me, and I just felt like, oh, God, I, I felt like a different, a new person. But it wasn't long until I, I realized that I'm still flesh and blood. It is a process. It is something that is ongoing. Let's please not get to the point where we, we, we judge people on, on their salvation because of our experience. I'm going to have to move on and, and leave some of this. This should have been maybe a, a two-part message. I'd like to think about uh, John 3.16 now. For God so loved the world. And there's kind of two... It's, not a five-point message, a two-point message, maybe if, if you will allow that. But it's this, this God is, is so loving that whosoever, and I like the wording, it, it, the, I know that's Old English, the King James, but whosoever, it doesn't matter where you come from. God is still saying, come. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter how rough your background was. It doesn't matter if you were born in the church. God is still saying, whosoever, whosoever. He's, the, his, the unselfish character and nature of God is something that, that is, I, I cannot explain completely how unselfish and how loving God actually 
is. One commentator, after writing an impressive number of commentaries, said simply this, God is love. That's how he explained it. He said, to sum it up, God is love. God loved us so much that while we were yet in sin, Romans 5.8, I think it's 5.8, God died for us. Paul says that, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Before we even said yes to God, he was there saying, come. He was there. He, I guess, washed the feet of Judas, and he knew that he was going to betray him. I've considered this and I thought, you know, the, the people that have hurt me and wronged me, it would be very difficult to go to that level. But that's God. God is the perfect blend of mercy and justice. He is, he is perfect. He is the perfect blend of grace and judgment. And the door is open. The door is open. Now I like to kind of circle back and, and talk a little bit about our response, the second part of, of John 3.16. John 3.16 is so, so powerful because there is a holy God that is giving invitation to all of us. And this morning it really doesn't matter if you've been born again for 50 or 70 years, God is still doing a work in your life if you let him. We often focus the salvation experience on youth and young people that have never made a commitment. But I, f I feel like salvation is something that's an ongoing experience, something that we, we constantly have to, to maintain our relationship. There is no autopilot in, in this relationship. But the second part then our response, believing on him, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Believing translates into action. And I, I struggled with this because we, we often get into this. It, it launches that whole argument about grace and works. And we finally get to the place where we... we if we just isolate one, one verse, it feels as though we coast into heaven only on grace, but it doesn't work that way. I'm, I'm fearful that there will be disappointments for those that feel like they can live as they please after they have experienced salvation and expect grace to, to save them. Ephesians 2.8 is where I usually go when I, I uh, and I'll, I'll just read a couple verses, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now that brings comfort to me because there is no way that I can be good enough for a holy God, and it is going to take grace. It will. Anyone that denies or, or even with their life it have those, I, I thought of this this morning, those that, that don't see their need for grace have a really difficult time extending grace to others. And that's just kind of a, a standard uh, something. But the NIV then says in verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And I... I, I I like to read, when people come to me with verse 8 and 9, I like to encourage people to also read verse 10 and then kind of turn that around and frame that in another way where we're no longer talking about uh, grace and works, but we're talking about obedience. So now back to John 3.16. Those that believe, it will trigger action. Obedience. Obedience, you can call that works if you want, but we are... It, it triggers action. There is action to our faith. Where we're not compelled to do anything, but we do because we want to. We see a holy God that loves us, and we want to return that. It is a response. God knew, God knows, that humans operate far better in a loving environment than they do in a harsh environment where there's hatred and, and animosity. God knows that. 
And I don't know with, I don't quite know how to explain what I, what I had on my heart this morning, but I think one of the things that the devil, that, that well, let me just put it this way. God is a God of love. We know that. And when his people are channels for his love and reaching others and those around them, it becomes a powerful thing. But when we neglect to show love to those that are around us, I'm saying God's love, we fail and we become those that shut up the kingdom of God for those around us. There are a few things that are as painful as not being loved by those that we're supposed to be loved by. And I, you can ponder that one. I'm going to have to, to close. I, there, there was so much more to say, but I, I just am unable to, to wrap this thing up and, and get it together. I, uh, but I, I would encourage all of us to every once in a while, it doesn't have to be Easter, just take time and ponder my relationship with God. And how does that work itself out? Because I find, even as a pastor, I, I find it's easy to get up and preach and tell people what they need to do without really taking time to drill down and see if I am right with God, if I have that relationship. One more thing that I'll say, just because I'm on the topic. Sometimes I hear statements like this made, where people will say, I helped 20 souls become saved. I, I prayed with, and then they say, or it was five or one. And I, this, this has kind of been a burden on my heart because I do not save anyone. I am only, and I want to emphasize this, I am only a beggar showing another beggar where to find a piece of bread. No more. I'm only a vessel. And when I get that thing turned around in my head and I get somehow get into God's position where I feel like I have to insert myself into every situation or it's going to go wrong, then we've missed it. And I've, this verse in John 6, 44 says, well, it says this, and I know it's dangerous just to pull one verse out. Now, I'm not at all saying I'm not preaching against the Great Commission. In fact, I encourage that. We are to partner with God and to share the gospel. And it is a blessing. No man cometh to the Father except the Father which hath sent me draw him. There is a drawing power that God has that I can't replicate. I'm only a vessel. I want to end up with the last verse in, that, in the chapter. Well, yeah, the last verse in John, in John 3. You know, we, sometimes we, uh, I hear people say that they, 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 they talk about, and, and maybe it's not a big deal at all, about their, how their worry went down and how they are no longer as discouraged and how things just seem to turn out better since they've become a Christian. And I, I am reading verse 36 here. And, and at the end of the chapter, and, and this is what, he, what John wrote, this is not red letter, he says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. So if we are saved, if we are saved, we are escaping the wrath of God. And what I'm trying to say here is, the, the lack of discouragement, the peace that we feel, and, and the, the things that, that we really enjoy about our Christian walk are byproducts of escaping the wrath of God. But first and foremost, if we are in the kingdom, we are escaping the wrath of God. Now, did I say anything? It is an invasion of the Holy Spirit into the heart and emotion of man that causes man to have a salvation experience. I don't know how else to say it, but it is not for me to judge. It is not for us to ridicule, but for us to encourage.
each other on the path. Because, I've said this before, we all get to this place in life where we, like Leroy said, it's the end of life, and whatever's left, it doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore how much money we had or how big our house was, but what really matters is that one thing, that connection with God. Don't neglect that. Don't neglect that connection with God. Spend, spend time praying. Spend time searching his, his word, and God will bless you for that. I'll end with that. Let's stand and have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our loving Father in heaven, we pause before you again and just acknowledge that, that you're sovereign, you're God, and you love each soul that is here. And you've brought us here this morning to worship you, and we adore you for that, Father. For the love that you've shared with us, the, the, the cost, the price that you paid so that we might someday walk the streets of gold. Father, I pray for each one that is here, and I pray that whatever connection that every individual, whether weak or strong, has with you, Father, I pray that you would strengthen that connection and that there would be a real intimate connection with you, Father. Lord, I just lift this group to you, and I pray that as we soon head out the doors and go our various ways, I pray that we would remember to to reach out to you on a daily basis with our problems, our struggles, and whatever else we're facing in life, in areas where we're failing, Father. I just plead that you would be real in these days, and when we're tempted to fall away, help us to remember the most important thing of all, to be connected with you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.